Hello everyone, my name is Mustafa Yakub Madaki. On behalf of my co-authors, I am here to present our study, Female, Farmer, Female Farmers' Participation in Off-Farm Livelihood Activities and Their Determinant in Rural Vultures at Nigeria. Women have inadequate access to and control over the productive resources such as land, capital, agriculture and inputs in agriculture. Mm. African women farmers participate in off-farm activities mainly to augment a small income from agriculture. The off-farm income refers to all income generating activities except crop and livestock production. Therefore, the aims of this study was to identify Adeline, you cannot, the major off-farm livelihood activities mm, mm, I can hear you, but I can't hear the video. Oh, it hasn't started yet. Oh, okay, I'm just, okay, I'm just, I'm just waiting for the okay of the whole Okay, perfect. Yeah. So, uh, that's good. Uh, All good, so thank you. I don't even notice of the whole whether we are like already. Descriptive statistics Usually. and logistic regression models were used for the analysis. There's already a presentation running, but I also cannot hear the descriptive hear report. The, the result in Table 1A shows that 42% of them are within the age bracket of 40 to 49. Dear host, are you Table here? Are we live? And can we maybe see the presentation from the beginning? Of, I might maybe introduce the first presenter before we start with the presentation. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Mustafa Yakub Madaki. On behalf of my co-authors, I am here to present our study, Female, farmer, female Farmers' Participation in Off-Farm Livelihood Activities and their determinant in rural vultures state Nigeria. Women have inadequate access to and control over the productive resources such as land, capital, agriculture and inputs in agriculture. African women farmers participate in off-farm activities mainly to augment a small income from agriculture. The off-farm income refers to all income-generating activities except crop okay. and livestock production. Um, I just assume that, that we are live, so we just was to start. identify the major <laughs> off-farm uh, livelihood the time. activities um, by rural women this farmers is the and their the time the very rural warm welcome to everybody. Well, in the yet, this, um, only five percent of registered rural um, women farmers were selected. I think we have at least sampling. five uh, posters. Uh, yeah, I think we have five or six posters that we can see now. And uh, we start directly with the first presenter. I have seen he's already here. Mustafa Yakubo Madaki um, presents a poster with the title "Female Farmers' Participation in Off Farm Activities." and their determinants in rural Bauchi state, Nigeria. Um, I wonder whether this is a video presentation and we can, we may be able to see it from, from the start. Or Mustafa, do you want to um, tell us something directly to the poster in live? Hello everyone. Yeah. Are you hearing me? Yeah, I hear you. Okay, that's very good. I'm mm -hmm. glad to meet you at this very important uh, conference and at this session. Uh, I think already I have made the video. I have made my the presentation and uploaded it. I don't know what do you what do you I don't understand your question. Do you want me to say something about the presentation or what? Actually, there is a video running, but we cannot hear any sound. Okay. But I think it's a technical problem, but the voice of my presentation is clear before I upload it. Proceed Except well. if I will going mm -hmm. to present Shania another survey was now. conducted mm -hmm. in 2017. Yeah. I have no, yeah, I, I addressed the logistic already the host, regression models were an used for the analysis. Um, in the descriptive revolve, the result in table one is shows that 42% of them are within the age bracket of 40 to 49. Figure 1B shows that 39% of them have secondary education. Figure 1C depicts that the 43% of the respondents cultivated less than one hectare. Figure 1D indicates that 63% uh -huh. of them ends between 27 to 55. 
can hear US now, dollars I, but monthly. I don't hear Well, if yet. you go to rebuild that, the major of farm activities engaged by the rural farmers are food product sale. Those, can you maybe try to restart it, it, the video from beginning? Hello everyone, my name is Mustafa Yakubu Madaki. On behalf of my co-authors, I'm here to present We still cannot hear anything. Hello everyone. My name is Mustafa Yakubu Madaki. On behalf of my co-authors, I am here to present our study, Female, farmer to, female Farmers' Participation in Off-Farm Livelihood Activities and Their Determinant in Rural Vultures State Nigeria. Women have inadequate no access to and control over the productive resources such as land, capital, agriculture, and inputs in agriculture. African women farmers Participate in off farm activities. I think if the problem persists, we have to switch to, to live explanation. The I mean, at least. All income generating activities except crop and livestock production. Therefore, the aims of this study was to identify the major off farm livelihood activities engaged by rural women farmers and their determinant in rural voters in Nigeria. In the Methodology: Five percent of registered rural women farmers were selected using multi-stage sampling procedure. A questionnaire survey was conducted in 2017. Hello, everyone. My name is Mustafa Yakubu Madaki. On behalf of my co-authors, I am here to present our study, Female, farmer to, female Farmers' Participation in Off-Farm Livelihood Activities and Their Determinant in Rural Voucher State, Nigeria. Women have inadequate access to and control over the productive resources such as land, capital, agriculture, and inputs in agriculture. African women farmers participate in off-farm activities mainly to augment a small income from agriculture. The off-farm income refers to all income-generating activities except crop and livestock production. Therefore, the aims of this study was to identify the major off-farm livelihood activities engaged by rural women farmers and their determinant in rural voters in Nigeria. In the methodology, 5% of registered rural women farmers were selected using multi-stage sampling procedure. A questionnaire survey was conducted in 2017. Descriptive statistics and logistic regression models were used for the analysis. In the descriptive revolve, the result in Table 1A shows that 42% of them are within the age bracket of 40 to 49. Figure 1B shows that 39% of them have secondary education. Figure 1C depicts that the 43% of the respondents cultivated less than 1 hectare. Figure 1D indicates that 63% of them ends between 27 to 55 US dollars monthly. Well, if you go to rebuild that the major of farm activities engaged by the rural farmers are food product sale, trading, food processing, and tailoring. Well, table one shows that the tailoring, food processing are found to significantly influenced by the access to credit, rural road, and, elect and electricity. And being a married woman, high, having high level of education, land ownership, and access to extension contact significant their participation into tailoring, trading, and food product sale. Access to credit, road, electricity, influence their participation into tailoring, tailoring, food processing, while access to rural market influence their participation into trading. In conclusion, food processing, non-foods, 
trade, non-food trading, farm product sale are the most common of farm activities engaged by the rural women farmers. Being married, have high level of education, land ownership are the main socio-economic characteristics affect their participation into tailoring, food processing, food and food product sale. Well, farm size affecting it in a negative way. Extension services, access to credit are the major institutional factor, factors influence their participation into tailoring, tailoring and processing. Access to road, electricity, market influence their participation into tailoring, non-food -trade, non trade, trading and food processing. Therefore, in our recommendation, focus should be directed to women with low level of education and less women in a program promoting off-farm livelihood activities. And finally, we emphasize the provision of extension services, facilitating rural credit program, rural electrification, road and market. Thank you for your listening. I am anticipating your questions. Hello, everyone. My thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Mustafa, are there any yes. questions? Mustafa's poster. Yeah, I have a question. <laughs> I've okay. seen in your presentation that um, most of these female farmers do have less than uh, one hectare. Uh, why is this? Do they not have access to more um, land or um, is this just um, uh, one little job to contribute to the whole family income, let's say that their family members are doing other jobs, or is that their full income they have from this one hectare? Yes, thank you for your question. Uh, first of all, as we mentioned before, at the introduction or background of the study that uh, women has less access to productive resources in agriculture. Mm -hmm. And these are our findings that we find is little bit higher than what reported by FAO 2018, which says Hi, that everyone. in the study area, specifically in, Tra in Taraba State, which is very close to the study area, that average women in, uh, women in that area, they have average of 0 0.7 hectare. That is less than one hectare, you see, which is very close to our finding. And this, what makes make it like that because of in the study area, most responsibility is shouldered on men. That is why men have more access to resources than women. That is why most of the women in that particular area, they used to engage in off-farm livelihood activities in order to augment or to complement the little, little income they usually get from the agriculture. All right, but, thank there you. So, but there are so many programs introduced by the government and policies in the study area in order to promote access to agricultural land and other agricultural input to the women. But some of them, they did not meet their objective and all that like this due to some problem. Most of the program policies are jointly programmed or uh, funded by the World Bank. Maybe World Bank they will is like a counter founding between the uh, the government and the World Bank for maybe two years or three years or four years. Lately, World, World Bank will draw will will draw and let the government to continue running the program. Most of the program, the moment the World Bank will draw, that is after three or four years, because of the lack of funding and other thing like this, the program have some problem as a result of shortage of funding and other thing like this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing these uh, detailed details with us. Um, I think uh, due to the time constraints, we have to move to the to the second uh, presentation already. Anyway, Katanya, are you here? I think I haven't seen uh, her. So we move on to the next one, Aline Roth is going to present um, a study titled, How is the issue of overaging of cocoa farming households influenced by their endowment with livelihood capitals? And I guess you have also uploaded a, a video that the host might start now, Nadine's video. 
Yeah. Hi everyone and welcome to my poster presentation about the aging cocoa generation in Bolivia, their endowment with livelihoods and how these two topics are linked to each other. Cocoa farmers in Alto Beni, Bolivia are aging. 70% of the cocoa producers in Alto Beni, Bolivia are over 50 years old and because of limited financial resources they have not the perspective to retire. Further, there are hardly any young farmers entering the cocoa production sector because of its missing profitability. This ongoing development could lead to a sudden drastic reduction in the numbers of cocoa farmers in the future of Alto Beni. Analyzing the livelihood data, it was thinking that members of a cooperative were better off in terms of livelihood endowment than not associated farmers. Members of the cooperative El Sebo, the biggest cooperative in the region of Alto Beni, were in average 15% better off than the other cocoa farmers. The livelihood endowment of a household is at best only weakly related to how successful cocoa farmers cope with old age, as for example planning retirement and securing farm succession. Structural problems such as low incomes and the absence of prospects in cocoa farming have a greater influence on how cocoa farmers deal with aging than their household's livelihood endowment. Independent on their livelihood endowment, cocoa farmers in Alto Beni do not retire in old age. They cannot afford it because of very low pensions, payments and missing savings. The farmers go on working as long as their health permits. 80% of the farmers pretend to live with their children in old age, which will take care of them. If retirement would be possible, their desired retirement age would be at 70. This slide presents the obstacles young farmers are confronted with. These are limited financial resources to invest in cocoa farming, new plant disease, limited available land plots, negative image of cocoa farming, high requirements for cooperative membership, and a lack of profitability and low and fluctuating market prices. I conclude that the main reasons for the overaging of cocoa farmers are the lack of prospects for the young, no formal support for the elderly, low cocoa bean prices and inefficient cocoa farming. It's needed that cocoa farming becomes more profitable and further the international cocoa sector as well as governments of cocoa producing countries must commit themselves to prosperity of cocoa farmers. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, Aline. Are there any questions you'd like to address directly to Aline? I would like to find out if there are programs by the government to encourage young people to go into the farming or they are just leaving it up to uh, nature to take its course. Thank you for your question. Um, in Bolivia, they have the national cocoa program. Um, it's not just uh, to increase the amount of uh, young farmers, it's in general. My name is Bernard Issa, and together with my co author, we welcome you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, they have an international, a national cocoa program, and they, this program aims um, to improve the cocoa business in Bolivia in general, not only for young, but of course, if um, yeah, they reach to get um, cocoa farming more profitable, it will get more interesting for uh, young farmers as well. So it's kind of an indirect uh, program for young farmers because they will yeah, um, profit from it as well as all farmers do. I was wondering um, actually, Aline, whether when you say that the age structure is like um, the, the farmers, the cocoa farmers are aging, 
but there are also the plantations are actually aging. And this might also be a hurdle for younger farmers to take over because there might be huge investments for replanting and so on, right? Yeah, this is a very good point. Um, especially when farmers do not have uh, the possibility to retire and they are getting weaker and they are doing just the minimum they are yeah, able to do on their uh, land plots. So the plots are getting overgrown and if maybe one day a, a young person uh, yeah, will take over this land plot, it's a high investment to get rid of old cocoa trees and of all this overgrowing. So that's um, yeah, a problem in terms of quality of available land plots. That's true, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Aline. So um, then let's move to the next presentation. That would be uh, by Rasha Binte Mohiudin. Um, um, but I don't know whether the presenter is here. I cannot, cannot see him in the list at least. So um, let's move to the next, um, the next presenter I've seen already. Um, Bernard Kwamena is going to present a poster with the title Rural Entrepreneurship, Motives and Barriers to Small Business in Ghana, a Gender Analysis. Can we please start this uh, short video? My name is Bernard Issa, and together with my co-author, we welcome you to our poster on rural entrepreneurship, motives and barriers to small businesses in Ghana, agenda analysis. The promotion of rural small-scale enterprises has gained much policy attention in developing countries. Due to the fact that rural industrialization has the potential to reduce poverty, rural urban migration, unemployment, and to make good use of available natural resources. Men has dominated this field over the years. However, women has made significant improvement in establishing businesses in rural communities in developing countries. The study was conducted in the Brownfield region of Ghana, West Africa. A multi state sampling technique was used to purposely select 10 rural communities in the Sunya East district. 200 small scale business owners were randomly selected for the study. The study was to find out if there are differences in the kind of businesses engaging by gender, and also if motives for certain businesses are different for both gender, and if they face the same challenges. The results on table one shows that women dominated the processing industry. This result is due to the minimum capital requirement to go into this venture. Men, however, were dominant in the artisanal and craft industries due to the level of expertise required to function. This is also significant to know that this resource is consistent with the sociocultural setting of rural areas in Ghana, where gender roles are ascribed for certain tasks. On motives and challenges, the resource shows a significant difference between gender. The resource shows that 89% of men cited economic reason as against 78% of women. This resource interprets that male entrepreneurs are more likely to go into business with economic motives than their female counterparts due to their social commitment and breadwinners for their families. The results also show that women are motivated to start business for personal satisfaction and for independence. It can be concluded that female entrepreneurs are more likely to engage into business as a means of gaining autonomy to be able to balance work and to meet family commitments. Looking at the challenges they face as startup, there was a significant difference between the two genders. Female entrepreneurs find it difficult in assessing capital as against their male counterparts. This could be as a result of the lack of collateral and access to landed property. Female entrepreneurs also find it difficult in sourcing for the needed human resource and also to assess markets. In conclusion, we suggested an improvement in access to financial capital and for market for women in starting businesses in rural areas of Ghana. Thank you for your attention. We welcome all your questions.
Yeah, thank you very much. Bernard Kormina, are there any questions in this room or from uh, the Q&A session? No, I don't see anything. Any questions from the other presenters? Yes. Yeah, please. My, I want to recommend him for the good presentation. My mm -hmm. question here is just a, since you find out that the the possible reason why women doesn't have enough capital for starting entrepreneurship or any business because of their lack of collateral, because they have maybe less access to land, landed property or something like this. Is there any microfinance or any, a, any credit initiative that does not require any landed property or any big collateral that women can meet this requirement and get this access to that credit? That's my question. Yeah, I think uh, uh, recently or uh, of late, they have yeah, a lot okay. of savings and loan schemes where women try to save a little bit of their capital. So once they're able to do that with their colleagues, they're able to mobilize a little bit of capital to go into uh, uh, entrepreneurship and mostly once they're able to mobilize the capital from that village savings and loan schemes, they deposit it with the former microfinance institutions, which helps them to access credits. So, so these are some of the schemes that most rural women are using to access former credit from former uh, financial institutions. Thank you. Any more questions? Bernard? Okay, then uh, let's move on. The next um, presentation is a study from uh, Russia. Um, the presenter is Lenka Hofiakova, and the title is The Prestige of Farmer Occupations Perceived by Russian Youth, the Case of Altai Krai. So, uh, quite a different topic. Can we see this uh, video? Is there any video? No. Thank you. Dear audience, my name is Lenka Opierkova and I'm acting at Faculty of Tropical Agri-Sciences, Czech University of Life Sciences. The topic of our study is the prestige of farmer occupations perceived by Russian youth, the case of Altai Krai. This research was financially supported by Internal Grant Agency of Faculty of Tropical Agri-Sciences. The primary data were collected in September and October 2018 through questionnaire survey conducted in Barnau, the administrative center of Altai Krai. This survey was conducted in order to analyze prestige level of farmer occupations, namely smallholder farmer, private farmer and farm manager from the perspective of young Russians and to determine factors influencing it. Altai Krai is the largest agriculture region in the Russian Federation. Convenient sampling method was used to collect data from 350 respondents. All the respondents were currently studying at the Altai State University. For the purpose of the research, descriptive and multiple linear regression analysis were used. Were supposed to rate 10 occupations from the perspective of prestige level. Mean prestige level of all rated occupations was 4.12. The results show that three of the most prestigious occupations were medical doctor, judge, and politician. In case of farmer occupations, they were rated rather as lower prestigious professions. Smallholder farmer was third worst rated occupation from all with mean 3.43. Private farmer received higher rating than smallholder farmer. However, even this profession did not have a higher rating than mean. Only farm manager had higher rating than average prestige of all occupations. Multiple linear regression models were run to test influence of certain independent variable on the dependent variable. There were three categories of independent variables, namely demographic characteristics, attitudes towards agriculture, and family background. 
Prestige level was set as dependent variable. Attitudes towards work in agriculture revealed the strongest effect on the prestige level of farming professions. Of which the variable agriculturist and exciting work was the best predictor. Next in order was opinion that agriculture is men work and low income work. On the figure 2, you can also see the direction of influence. Students with the opinion that agriculture is exciting work rated all farmer occupations with higher prestige. In case of variables, men work and low income work, the, directions were, the direction was opposite. Mainly due to the opinion that agriculture is not exciting work and also due to the opinion that it's a low income work and work where men dominate, farmers' professions were sorted rather among a lower prestigious occupation from the perspective of respondents. In order to increase prestige level of farmers, these three variables should be taken into account as the most important ones. Thank you for your attention. And now, if you have any questions, I'm looking forward to answer it. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Lenka, are there any questions? Yes, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, thank you for this uh, very interesting presentation. It is very close to the topic I have done research in. And you have the same um, result that um, the interest is not that uh, low from young people to work in agriculture, but that the image is very bad. So um, do you have any recommendation what uh, measures could be implemented in order to make farming activities um, or to, to, to change the image of farming activities? Uh, well, thank you for, for your question. Uh, it's, it's a good question, definitely. Uh, I, I cannot really say that, uh, that, uh, that their interest is, is not so low because we, we ask students at, at Alta State University, it's not an agricultural university, and according to our data, only 1% of those students could, could imagine their career in, in agriculture. So we, we don't know a uh, like representative sample. Uh, but uh, we also asked some students from biological faculty and also some students from IT faculty and, and sociology faculty. And, and we also found that uh, the students from biological faculty were somehow closer to understand the, the work of farmers. So uh, I think more, more cooperative between, uh, between universities and farmers should be. Uh, should be. Uh, I think students should, should or universities should uh, somehow help students to to visit some farms and see uh, how does it work in practice, how complex the, the work is. Uh, is Everyone, just I am Masoud Yazdampano from Agriculture, Science and Natural Resources University of Khuzestan, Iran. Okay. Can you stop the presentation? We are still discussing. Yeah, okay, go on, please. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I think uh, it should be more interactive because, uh, as according to our result, it's not only about money, but also about if they can see uh, how their career can improve or how they can uh, how they can develop themselves or mm -hmm. improve their, their skills. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Very interesting. Yeah. Very interesting, yeah. So, in your opinion, it's it's rather a matter of of the um, education at, at university that it is not practice oriented enough. Yes. Mm. I see. Yeah, very interesting. We move to the last topic for today. Again, a very different topic. Um, this is a study from Iran. Masoud uh, Yatstan Pana will present a poster with the title. Understanding farmers' shock coping capacity 
in dealing with coronavirus pandemic in Iranian case study. Can we see this video now? Everyone, I am Masoud Yazdanpanov from Agriculture, Science and Natural Resources University of Khuzestan, Iran and present our article entitled Understanding Farmers' Short Coping Capacity in Dealing with COVID-19, an Iranian case study. Rural households are often exposed to severe shocks of various nature. Shocks are beyond the control of an individual and typically arose in the case of unexpected response against an exogenous occurrence. Shocks are a constant phenomenon for farmers and rural households, especially in developing countries. These shocks include disease, pests, climate change, input prices, fluctuations, war, and political shocks that reduce the well-being of farmers and their families. COVID-19, an emerging infection disease, can be considered as one of the major shocks for all communities, especially rural communities. COVID-19 poses various challenges to patients and their families in physical, psychological, financial, social, and cognitive dimensions and causes major disruptions in their lives. It has also led to significant change in healthcare, economic transportation, education, and agriculture system around the world. The disease currently has significant effects on the agriculture sector and in addition to treating people's health has a severe effect on the livelihoods of poor rural farmers who depend on agriculture. Certainly, in developing countries, the shocks of this disease will be much more severe because most farmers in rural areas in these countries are prone to poverty and extreme vulnerability. As a result of the frequent occurrence of various shocks and limited access to formal mechanisms to deal with these shocks and farmers' ability to break through the vicious circles of poverty is jeopardized and limited due to their vulnerability to repeated shocks. Providing adequate support to those who are or will be vulnerable, it's critical to ensuring compliance with restrictions as well as preventing increasing level and depth of poverty due to the COVID-19. In order to design appropriate support measures for the effects of COVID-19, it is necessary to know the perception and response of individuals and their current situation. The aim of this study is to investigate the factors affecting choking coping capacity of farmers. To achieve this, we adopt the theory of cognitive stress to analyze and explain how farmers respond to COVID-19 induced stress. The theory of cognitive stress was designed based on treats and stressors in human lives. Stressors form the, form the core of the theory and emphasizes the transactions that occur, and occur between individuals and their environment. As you can see in the figure, the, the, three, the four independent factors impacts on moderator, moderator factors problem-focused coping and problem-focused coping directly influence dependent variable or behavior responses. We use a survey to data collection through questionnaire online with multiple item, items with five point Likert scale. Our participants was farmers in Boucher province in south of Iran in the shores of Persian Gulf. We use different tools and statistics to uh, measure reliability and validity of our measurement and our questionnaire. 
the result uh, regarding the relationship between the theory variables uh, shows in the table one as you see all the variables have correlation with the behavior response furthermore a structure equation modeling shows the demand appraisal and collective efficacy together can predict 63 percent of coping while public support and self-efficacy have not any effect on the coping and in other sites coping and public support can predict 31 percent of farmers responses behavior According to the research results, when farmers experience stresses such as COVID-19, their evaluation method as well as collective efficacy encourage them to use problem-based coping responses. Government support, along with the coping responses, then leads individuals to engage in coping behavior with COVID-19. It is recommended that in times of stress and tension such as the outbreak of epidemics, sufficient information about the consequence of the outbreaks of the disease, its neg negative in impact, its prevalence, and other information about the threats and damage of these shocks to farmers to be able to provide psychological answers and ultimately appropriate coping measures and welcome comments and questions yeah okay thank you masoud are you actually here in the room to answer any question because i cannot see your name uh, it appears that the presenter is not present in this room so in case um, there are questions to Mr. Masoud Yatstanpana, you might address him personally via the messages on, on WUWA's system. Yeah, so um, then it uh, leaves me to thank you all for your very interesting contributions to this poster session was a very broad range of topics and that made it very interesting and I enjoyed it very much. And I hope you did as well. Um, yeah, hope to see you somewhere again and uh, yeah, enjoy the rest um, of the conference. And yeah, then I would say goodbye to you. Thank you. Bye goodbye, bye. thank bye you. Bye, bye. thank you. <laughs>